coming up on Capitol Crossfire. Pivotal elections in 2021 offer a preview to the 2022 midterms. A UN climate change summit offers new policy proposals and the January 6th Select Committee releases a new round of subpoenas. Joining us from the left, Dylan Hayden, and from the right, Quentin Burian. And I'm your moderator, Jessica Nix. From the GWTV studios in Washington, D.C., this is Capital Crossfire. Virginia and New Jersey just wrapped up elections for governor that show an interesting divide from 2020. In 2020, both states voted for President Biden. Biden won Virginia by 10 points and New Jersey had a 16 point divide between Biden and Trump. Republican Glenn Youngkin took the governorship in Virginia by two points and the Democrat incumbent Phil Murphy won with a slim majority in New Jersey. Are these elections and other November 2021 elections an early prediction of the midterms happening a year from now? And is the Republican strategy that elected Youngkin the new model after President Trump? Our panel is here to discuss that and more. On the left, Dylan Hayden, a freshman from Granbury, Texas. Dylan is a political science major with a focus in public policy. On the right, Quentin Burian, a junior political science major from Center Mo Riches, New York. Quentin is an intern in the campaign finance and consulting sector. Thank you both for joining us today. We'll start with the 2022 midterms and recent elections. A new party holds the governorship in Virginia. Glenn Youngkin won the seat on November 2nd over Democrat Terry McAuliffe, flipping the state from blue to red. Republicans also won down ballot in Virginia for Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, and in the State House of Representatives. In New Jersey, incumbent Governor Phil Murphy won with a slim margin. The race was called the day after the election in the predictably blue state. Some are pointing to high Republican turnout across those states as the main reason for the GOP wins. In 2020, President Biden won Virginia by 10 points over President Trump, and Biden won in New Jersey by 16 points. So what changed, and are these elections predictors of a GOP win in 2022 midterms that are just a year away? So we're going to get started with um, Glenn Youngkin walking a thin line between embracing Trumpism and to win Trump's base and distancing himself from the former campaign president. His campaign also made education and mask mandates a main issue. So here we're gonna start with um, some sound from Youngkin's acceptance speech talking about his education plan. We're gonna invest in teachers, new facilities, special education. We're gonna introduce choice within our public school system. How about that choice within the public school system? Quentin, we're going to start with you. What worked in the Republican messaging in Virginia, and what should Republicans apply to the strategy in 2022? Well, firstly, thanks for having me back. Uh, listen, uh, Glenn Youngkin's strategy was simple. Uh, it was not to fall into the trap of, of turning into a Trump candidate. Um, he campaigned on issues of education, of, of, of economics, um, and ultimately did much more to stick to policy rather than his opponent who simply wanted to call him Trump 2.0. Uh, and I think that has to be the strategy going forward with Republicans in future elections, both for the midterms uh, and for the presidency in 2024. It's not about so much as winning the culture war. It's about speaking to pocketbook issues of Virginians and eventually for uh, uh, the nation, right? So to simply uh, uh, view his campaign as just walking the line between Trumpism, I think is really not fair because the state uh, was 10 points Biden just two years ago. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, this midterm for the governorship was not a, uh, a large swath of first time voters, right? So these are the same voters who, s who voted for Biden because they were rejecting Trump, fair enough. And then in, in, uh, in the first 10 months of a presidency saw that wasn't working and is now rejecting that policy uh, at the state level. And I think that ultimately is what Republicans have to focus on, sticking to pocketbook issues, rejecting the Biden policy, rejecting the Biden administration, and that will carry uh, uh, far and wide for Republicans coming 2022 and coming 2024. So Dylan, one of the voting blocks that did switch from Biden to Youngkin uh, in this race was suburban white women. So how can Democrats counter this messaging and win back some of those voting blocks next year like suburban white women? Well, look, 
here's the deal of the situation. What you have here is uh, basically a uninspiring, uh, unenergetic Democratic contender for the race of governor. And that really played to a lot of these uh, second time voters like Quinton was saying. You had the, uh, and especially uh, Terry McAuliffe had his foot in his mouth almost every step of the campaign. He, uh, the biggest blunder of his was I would say education. You know, parents, uh, especially suburban white women, they care about what their children are learning and how they're learning it. And saying that you're not gonna have an input on this definitely had an impact on the campaign. But I think we're, we're all failing to miss the second, content the second point, which is that this is an off year election. We're talking about um, overanalyzing every aspect of a race between two states only. Now, are we saying that um, moderate Republicans traditionally have had a uh, better say in uh, terms of uh, statewide elections? Well, uh, if Virginia is to say, then sure. But can you really apply the Virginia model all over the United States? America is a diverse country, and I think that uh, uh, putting blinders on just these two outcomes is a little naive of us. So New Jersey was not called until the next day for the election for incumbent Phil Murphy. So Dylan, why was the election so close in New Jersey and some point to high Republican turnout for that reason? So why are Democrats not showing up in New Jersey? Uh, it appears to just uh, possibly an it's an uh, issue about just enthusiasm and understanding that uh, people in state politics, state politics are weird. People in state politics care about uh, the issues of the state. What we saw in uh, uh, terms of Virginia specifically, it was uh, on the top three issues for the exit polling, it was, most, it was all domestic, and the number one being education. And in Virginia, it's just a simple matter of uh, seeing who can get the most turnout. And uh, the energy happened to be there for the Democratic Party this time, but it definitely came out in swing for the Republicans. Uh, Quentin, similar question. Um, in New Jersey, why was Republican turnout so high? Is it a rejection of Biden's COVID policies or actions in Afghanistan, or are there other reasons to point to? Well, it's certainly a rejection of, of Biden, and I, it's certainly a rejection of our handling of the pandemic recently, the handling of the troop withdrawal from Afghanistan, right? And unfortunately, yes, it makes a case that all all politics are now presidential and and in reality, most voters are not are looking to governorships now as the as the rebuke to a presidential administration. In reality, is that is that the best way to measure uh, uh, if voters are really satisfied with the Biden administration? I, I don't quite know. Um, but what I will say, you know, is is uh, Governor uh, Murphy of New Jersey uh, pre-election, you know, if your number one issue in New Jersey is high taxes, this is not the state for you, right? And that is a very damning quote for uh, a Democrat in a state where he, it's quite a slim majority that he won. And, you know, Jack Cittarelli was a great candidate, but Jack Cittarelli is, is he's, a, he's a Republican, you could replace it with anybody, and I think the turnout would still be the same for Republicans, especially in southern uh, New Jersey, where we saw a lot of those counties go red. Um, and I think, I think m even though uh, Phil Bur uh, Governor Murphy won his reelection, it's a telling sign to incumbent Democrats uh, that their seats are not safe uh, at the state level, and I think that. Uh, people are tired of the, the assumption that the, uh, an incumbency is a guaranteed seat for the next cycle, right? And, and people have to be aware that state politics now, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, how do I put it? It's, it's now the, the, the step in which voters can, can let the current administration know that we're coming for you, uh, you know, and and ultimately, if you're gonna if you're gonna run a candidate like Phil Murphy, you have to expect that that uh, New Jerseyans are are you know only gonna elect him by a slip margin. So you know, I think it's it's important though to understand that that the people are speaking to the Biden administration with these elections. Whether that's an appropriate step, not quite sure. But again, that's what's happening here, and that's what happened. That's why. Virginia is now a red state, why Murphy only won by slim margin, but also why uh, the ballot initiatives in New York State were voted down heavily, the ballot initiatives in Minnesota for the uh, 
the uh, abolition of their police force were voted down heavily, right? E even those, which were not even uh, elections, but nearly ballot initiatives, were wholly rejected by voters in those states. A and that has to be telling to people that these policies are not popular. So, you know, at the end of the day, this is this is the 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 way p this is the way people view elections now, and uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, even though it's a state election, it's going to be a concern over federal policy, and it's going to be a concern over initiatives at the ballot box, and th I think that's the reality of American politics going forward, and the reality of how voters view midterm cycles, and maybe this will be we'll get a little more engaged, and we'll come out. You know, and not just be swaths of primary voters uh, uh, in the midterms. It'll be a broader class of people because a broader class of people will see that, hey, I can make significant impact in a midterm cycle election. So, you know, I want to cut you off right there, and I'm going to throw to Dylan really fast to get your response. So, if you're saying that these governorship elections are uh, a recall of the president or an assessment of the president, um, so the bipartisan infrastructure bill is one of Biden's huge policy proposals um, that has finally passed after months and months of debate and, and entering the news cycle. So Dylan, is this bill too little too late to help Democrats in these special elections? And how can Democrats recover before next year if these uh, midterm elections and these special elections are this assessment of the presidency? Well, let's, let's look at the timing of when this uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill managed to come into effect. This came in almost immediately after uh, Terry McAuliffe's loss in the Virginia election. So uh, once again, like I was previously saying, Virginia isn't so much a test of the Biden era as it, I as it is um, a test of voter enthusiasm. And what drives the voters' enthusiasm is uh, the Democratic Party sticking to their base promises and uh, making sure that they're accomplishing what needs to be done. And uh, after McAuliffe's loss, the Democratic Party uh, got their heads in the right game. They managed to pass their bipartisan infrastructure bill, and now reconciliation packages are back on the table, and uh, the party seems to be moving forward with their original promises. So, Quentin, for next year, um, are the issues of mask mandates in schools and issues that Youngkin ran on enough to sustain the strategy for next year? I think you've touched on it a little bit, but I want to go a little bit deeper. Uh, I th yeah, absolutely. I think education, because it was in the spotlight for almost a year, given the pandemic, um, a, a, a large amount of parents were home for a year and were witnessing the teaching that went on in a lot of the public schools across the country. And a lot of these schools uh, and these students were not blessed to have a public school teacher like my mom, who cared about her students. A lot of these teachers, unfortunately, and why it's such a popular issue among suburban voters is suburban voters were home for a year to see just how terrible their, the education uh, of their children was in a public school setting. And it's unfortunate that it took uh, a global pandemic for parents to really want to get involved in this sector. But the reality is parents have had a year to study uh, 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 what went on in public schools. And I think uh, Youngkin's plan to prevent uh, CRT in schools is an excellent idea. Uh, to invest in charter schools is an excellent idea. To raise uh, the state pay of public school teachers in the state of Virginia is a great plan, right? These are policies that are going to make lives significantly better in the state of Virginia. There'll be an option for school choice, and there'll be a, uh, uh, an option to, to significantly invest in the public schools of Virginia. Both things can happen at once, and I think those are definitely uh, uh, issues in which Youngkin can, uh, and the Republican Party in general can sustain uh, that message through next year, because it didn't just happen in Virginia. It happened in all 50 states, and I think that's something that will seriously carry on uh, through the next election cycles. In, in what way has this happened in all 50 states exactly? What do you mean? Well, uh, just the, like this uh, rejection of this, uh, what you, the CRT and other education policies. Well, by, put, by, what, by what point, way have they uh, impacted all 50 by states? Point, my point is that parents have been home for a year to see their kids uh, learn uh, uh, virtually for a year. That's happened in all 50 states. So my point being is that uh, uh, 
whether whether the the uh, obviously there are disparities in that, and I'm not saying that every education at home was terrible. Certainly not the one my mom was giving uh, to her students, but that the uh, uh, that the fact that parents were home for a year to observe everywhere means that's an issue that can that impacts everybody everywhere. Obviously not to the same level, but it's an issue that could be talked about everywhere, right? Because it happened to students in literally all 50 states. We were home for a year. So I think that is a reason the message will carry. Every parent has some level of, of grievance with their, with their school district now. And yes, that's a part of an unfortunate uh, reality of the pandemic, but it's now involved parents and their students' education. I think that's very important. I, I can agree with you that education is an incredibly important subject for uh, parents especially, especially considering the pandemic. But um, when you're looking at other things that Youngkin ran on, the mask mandate and um, his downright, um, I don't want to say so much uh, misinformation, but kind of um, misinterpretation of other uh, policies that uh, he kind of said the Democrats were going to impose. Do you think that's a sustainable strategy? Well, what for what for what, poli in the future? what policy did he specifically misrepresent? I'm specifically representing um, uh, the critical race theory and the misrepresentation so of it. Uh, a lot of what it sounds like is a lot of people on um, many sides of the spectrum don't fully understand what is trying to what the goal to accomplish is with critical race theory. So what I will say to that is, uh, it was about two days ago, an op-ed was published in the Washington Post. Uh, essentially rejecting the Democrats' gaslighting on the issue. Uh, the Loudoun County School Board, it's public record, you can go and Google it right now, on their website, says that you know we've, we've spent uh, over $300,000 of the school budget on an equity and diversity training that will work to uh, install the ideas of CRT in, in teachers so that they can bring those ideas to the classroom, right? I mean, that's public record. And Yes, we in this room and at this university can understand that there are levels to CRT. There's the CRT that's taught in law schools, and then there's the CRT that, that uh, funneled out of law school and became mainstream, right? And I understand that that distinction is not necessarily made in Virginia, but at the end of the day, it's public record from the school board themselves saying we're going to pay for this kind of training that is going to install these ideas. And those ideas were rejected at the ballot box. And I absolutely think that in any other state where this is going on, where it's public record that a school board is spending money on this, that if a Republican wishes to, go to message on that, they absolutely should. Parents don't want it in their schools. And it should be, it's absolutely the right of a Republican candidate to say, I'm going to make sure that it's not. And that wraps up our first topic. When we come back, our panel will dive into a recent climate summit. Stay with us. Raise high. This isn't just our battle cry. It's our call, our challenge. Because when you were called to Washington, you were called to higher expectations, to a higher standard. We are called here to advance knowledge, to serve society, to change the world. Is that too lofty, too aspirational? Is it simply too much to expect? Not if your classroom is a Smithsonian, the IMF, or on the doorstep of the Supreme Court. Not if you have access to the most hallowed institutions and formidable leaders. Not if you are given the tools to change minds, shape laws, influence entire fields of study, advance our way of life, change the course of history. From the nation's capital to the four corners of the earth, to far below the surface and far beyond our atmosphere. Here, unique opportunities, the ones that many people work much of their lives to get, are within your reach from the moment you arrive. This is where you find new pathways for preventing global epidemics, where your unexpected friend propels a new scientific movement forward. This is where you push forward as a team to break records and reach new heights, where your classroom is 68 square miles of the most consequential land on earth. This is where you will make it happen. This is the George Washington University, and what we make is history. So stand up, be bold, take risks, press on, push harder, raise high.
These past few weeks, over 130 international government leaders have gathered in Glasgow, Scotland to meet about climate change and set new emission standards. The meeting is the 26th gathering of the Conference of Parties, COP26 for short. Not in attendance, presidents from Russia, China and Brazil. With the rise of clean energy across the globe, greenhouse emissions are curving downward. However, the purpose of COP26 was to highlight that more still needs to be done. Scientists are saying countries need to make sharp turns away from fossil fuels to not feel the worst effects of climate change. India pledged to significantly increase renewable energy, but coal would still be their main source of electricity. A large goal of the summit is to present policies that will keep the global temperature rise under 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, leaders would have to implement huge policy goals to cut emissions so temperatures do not rise above the mark in the next 10 years. Dylan, we're going to go to you first. Will COP26 have a realistic effect on leaders following through on commitments, or is it just political theater on a world stage? I think it's unfair to call it just political theater because let's look at what COP, what the uh, Conference of Parties really is. And essentially, it's not the end all be all of uh, maintaining our climate and keeping emission standards uh, that to capped at where they need to be. It's the foundation that nations and other entities use to build future climate policy. Uh, we saw this especially in 2017 when, Don President, when then President Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, despite the federal government's, uh, the executive branch's unwillingness to continue with it, you had states across the U.S. who continued with it and several uh, major corporations that continued with uh, capping their emission standards and trying to encourage renewable energy. So I believe that COP26 and these other uh, summits are really accomplishing their goal, which is getting us in the mindset of renewable energy. Even with uh, nations like uh, China and India, big, large polluters, even though China is still relying on fossil fuels, they've made it clear that they intend to switch and be the lead producer in renewable energy. And I think that's what's really trying to be accomplished with COP26. So Quentin, what real policy change will we see out of this summit internationally and also domestically? Well, I'd just like to point out, I think the sad reality is that as long as China doesn't show up to these, or Russia shows up to these proceedings, what difference does policy make? Uh, China is one of the world's leading producers of carbon emissions, and they're still pledging, even though they've said, oh, we're going to you know, reduce our emissions. That's at some point, and that was the same problem with the Paris Climate Accords, was that it put no standard on when the Chinese should stop polluting. Right? They're continuing to build coal plants because they realize that right now, renewable energy is not sustainable for their, for their growing uh, nation state. And I don't I don't see any policy coming out of COP26 as being relevant if it's not holding the Chinese to account. World producers of global emissions need to be held to account. And so long as the Chinese do not take COP things like COP26 seriously, that they don't uh, um, you know, uh, come to the table to start reducing their, their, their uh, emissions, I mean, what difference does it make? W the United States will certainly take action. We have been. We're reducing our emissions. We're, uh, we've on a trend since t about 2015, 2016. It's been on a general downward, de uh, uh, downward slope of our emissions. Uh, so, you know, and we're, we're, we're doing what we can. But at the end of the day, what difference does policy make if the world's polluters don't show up to, to uh, reconcile their differences? But if you're thinking about um, nations that need to uh, reduce their emissions, it's only within their best interest. You've got nations like uh, China, where cities like Beijing are perpetually covered in smog. You can't tell me that the government think that that thinks that that's okay. They're putting uh, more regulations on it, encouraging electric vehicles to be sold by um, instituting uh, uh, more, rele more relaxed uh, restrictions on driving within city limits for EVs. Well, it's not that the, it's not that the Chinese don't think that the smog in Beijing is a problem. It's just that they don't care. Right now, their concern is with becoming a global superpower. And a global superpower for them, in their eyes, does not mean hamstringing their economy for renewable energies. Th they don't care. That's the problem. They're willing to pollute until you can't, I, I mean, all you, all you have to do is look at the uh, pollution uh, pre-March of 20, uh, of pandemic March and April of the same year. 
you could actually see China from space when China closed down because of the pandemic. You could not before from the smoke, but they don't care. That's the problem. They could say all they want and pledge the Biden administration, oh yes, we're gonna be nice and play along and, and reduce our, our global carbon emissions, but really they don't care. Their, their, their goal is to, is to crush on the world stage. So, you know, I, I agree with you that yes, it is in their best interest in the long run to uh, uh, ultimately not become so reliant on coal as an energy source. But at the moment, they don't care, and they're not going to care so long as we continue to placate them by saying, well, good job, China, thanks for this like fake agreement, you know, awesome. But once again, it's not a fake agreement. We're talking about building the foundation to which other agreements will be built upon, and the, cl and the culture is already shifting towards climate change. Right now, uh, not but 10 years ago, people were still talking about whether or not climate change was even real, and now we recognize it's real, and we need to do something about it. The oh, debate is now absolutely. over how much do we need to do. Absolutely. And uh, the question is, will COP26 give us the ability to be more serious about it? And I think yes. Well, I'm not, I'm not arguing that, that the Chinese don't think climate change is not real. Oh, no, real. And, I'm, and I'm not claiming that you are. It's, it's just, again, I don't think they don't care. And part of the... Part of the reason that they don't care is because they and the United States both have a little window into the future right now of, electric, uh, of, of grids that are maintained primarily by renewable energies. You see this in the United Kingdom. You see this in France. You see this in Germany. Uh, their attempt at providing much of their electricity through renewables is not a sustainable practice. They now have some of the highest energy prices in the developed world. What does that mean? Well, for the Germans, it means even though they demolish their nuclear plants, it means building coal plants again. Same thing for the, uh, uh, for the United Kingdom. It's buying gas from the Russians. For the French, it's turning back on their nuclear reactors because what they're realizing is that, yes, climate change is an issue, but we cannot we cannot s move solely to renewables and expect that to be a viable solution right now. And I think for the United States, that's worthwhile policy to consider. And certainly for the Chinese, it's, it's proving their point that they shouldn't care because everything the people at these conferences are saying they're going to do, they're just going back to coal and buying gas from the Russians. So why would they care then? Well, they could sign anything they want. They signed the Paris Climate Accord. Did the Paris Climate Accord put a cap on their emissions? No, it didn't. It didn't even hold them to any higher standard or to any penalty for failing. Did the United States hold themselves to a standard? Absolutely, we did. And, and as a result, yes, we've seen, through, primarily through market forces, our global emissions decline. But it's not the same for the Chinese because they just don't care. So cutting emissions from burning coal, oil, and gas are huge ways to for the world to help reach this 1.5 mark, as you guys have been kind of talking about. So there was a recent congressional hearing with oil executives that included the House Oversight Committee addressing oil executives fueling misinformation about climate change. So here's Representative Carolyn Maloney from New York. I want each of you to affirm that your organization will no longer spend any money either directly or indirectly to oppose efforts to reduce emissions and address climate change. So Quentin, no executive answered Representative Maloney's request. How does the government hold oil executives accountable and move oil companies towards cleaner energy domestically? Well, I mean, first of all, it's unfortunate that those companies would not pledge in that hearing. I understand why they don't do that, you know, a lot of these hearings are unfortunately a little bit of theater. Um, but at any rate, it is still sad to see that. Um, ultimately, the way we hold oil companies to account is by allowing the market to phase out their products and force them to innovate. It's not going to come from government regulations or from, from massive spending from the government because ultimately we've we again we can look to the future in the united in the in europe right now their uh, policy to move so forward into renewables uh is is um actually hamstringing them but forcing them to go backwards right you know and and right now we're looking at gas prices that are some of the highest they've been in quite a, some time we're looking at home heating prices have been the highest in quite some time 
now we're also begging the uh, Saudi Arabians and OPEC to produce more oil uh, because we have decided to go backwards on our energy policy through the Biden administration. You know, ultimately, we want to hold companies to account. We, uh, the government should certainly look to uh, the private sector to help subsidize green energy, to get it moving, to get the ball rolling. But at the end of the day, the, these companies will be held to account when the market phases out their products. And that's the best way forward for this nation and for any other nation that would like to follow suit. So, Dylan, cutting oil emissions would be a huge feat, but would be necessary to combat climate change. So how does the government work with private oil companies to cut those emissions? Well, to Quinn's extent, I, I, uh, I agree. We need to be subsidizing these methods to uh, produce green energy, and we need to make it a viable option for these uh, oil companies and these other corporations. Because ultimately, who are they held accountable to? They're not held accountable uh, to the environment. They're certainly not held accountable to their own consumers. They're held accountable to their shareholders. And what do the shareholders want? They want fast profits. They want, they want easy money. They want to see their stocks rise. They want to see their portfolios get bigger so they can move on to the next big thing. Well, uh, wh the, the, the other way in which we hold traditional energy companies to account is to bring back our, or, or rather to end the current moratorium on fracking uh, in the United States. That was a, a policy move by the Biden administration in its first 100 days. Uh, because what do we know about natural gas? Natural gas is a much cleaner burning fossil fuel. It can support a large number of homes. We have the infrastructure right now to, to, to warm homes for the, through the winter through natural gas, right? It has, natural gas is not the end all. The end all is a combination of nuclear and renewables. That's the best plan forward. But right now, we do not have the infrastructure for either of those things. What we do have at the moment is natural gas. And, and going backwards on natural gas is a policy failure by this administration. And we used to be a net exporter of energy. That matters for a few reasons, both domestically and internationally. Um, but at the end of the day, we were producing our natural gas, and we were selling it to ourselves, and we were selling it to the world stage. Natural gas is a transition energy, but it is a way in which we can slowly transition from traditional fossil fuels to a more renewable. Because at the end of the day, I agree with you. It, they're not, by definition, fossil fuels are not renewable. So they're not sustainable, and we're going to run out of them. So I absolutely agree that the transition has to happen. The problem being is that if we go too fast, like the Europeans have done currently, we'll end up going, we'll, we'll set ourselves back a decade. So instead, we should be looking to, right now, to natural gas and to bring back, start to bring back nuclear infrastructure, start to revamp and, and continue to build out our green infrastructure and create an energy grid that is not solely reliant on one power versus the other. Well, if we're looking at uh, things like, like I know you mentioned, uh, uh, nations like Germany and France's reliance on uh, Russian natural gas, uh, wouldn't that be another push factor into uh, countries like uh, like uh, Eastern, uh, Western Europe uh, pushing more towards energy independence, which has shown to be uh, renewable energy is the best. But by they, law. so yes, but they don't have the infrastructure to do it right now, and they are not energy independent, and they rely on purchasing from the world stage, mm -hmm. which means either they buy coal, like the Germans are doing now, or they turn on their nuclear plants like the French do. And I'm happy to work, uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to you know, hash out policy on how we could bring back a, a, a more robust nuclear energy, excuse me, uh, because at the end of the day, that, that is energy that will sustain us for the long run. Um, you know, so long as the, the Europeans push for very heavy climate regulations is a detriment to themselves and to the immediate. I mean, their energy prices are some of the highest in the developed world. That is not sustainable policy. And ultimately, it's going to have to come down one way or the other. The people will not stand for it. And we're seeing that here in the United States as well with the rise in the price of gas and the, in home heating. You know, the winter is upon us. And for a lot of folks, 
Right now, the debate is not over, well, should I power my home with a solar panel or through natural gas? It's, I want to keep my family warm, right? So that, that's the end of the debate. It's, it, you know, and and un until we satisfy that immediate need, which I think is through natural gas, then we can have the debate about, okay, how do we shift away from natural gas to more sustainable and more cleaner burning energy? But again, Wait, it, I'm going to cut you off there. And Dylan, yeah, let's give you the, the last yeah. word real fast to yeah. respond. I can see your point on uh, natural gas being a good transition factor. But um, as somebody from the high plains of Texas, uh, right on a shale belt where a lot of the fracking is taking place for things like oil and natural gas, uh, you can't ignore the human impact of actually physically going in there and cracking that limestone. Uh, you have uh, houses that are nearby where the intense amount of water and pressure that's being used to release these deposits are leaking into groundwater supplies that's going into people's homes. You have, um, in some cases, you have people's uh, faucets that can literally be caught on fire. There's a human impact to doing all this drilling, and while it is on paper a really good transition, uh, transition fuel, it has the ability to heat more people and uh, with uh, less, it's I, we can't possibly um, consider this without considering also the human impact of it. And that's going to wrap up our debate on climate change. When we come back, rapid fire, stay with us. Hi, Colonials. Did you know there are hundreds of ways for you to volunteer with GW? Each year, over 1,500 alumni, parents, and friends contribute thousands of hours to make our community stronger. There are countless ways you can volunteer, so it's easy to choose an opportunity that is most meaningful to you, like connecting with students and alumni based on your student involvement, identity, or personal interests, getting involved with your local alumni network, mentoring a current student via our online mentoring platform, connecting with prospective students through undergraduate admissions opportunities, serving on an industry network leadership council, becoming a social media ambassador. The list goes on. No matter where you are in the world or how much time you have to give, you can connect and volunteer with GW. And the best part, it's easy to get involved. Just visit alumni.gwu.edu slash volunteer to learn more about these and other opportunities. Because of your service to GW, you are able to make a direct impact on the lives of former, current, and future students. We look forward to working with you. Raise high. Our panel now joins us for rapid fire. Some quick answers to some quick questions. Up first, presidential approval ratings. Biden's approval ratings are in the low 40s, according to CNN. The exact number is 42%. The ratings are the lowest of any president except President Trump at this stage of the administration. The Build Back Better agenda is the president's economic plan to fight climate change and create jobs, and maybe a last-ditch effort to save his approval rating. The recent bipartisan infrastructure bill has finally passed both chambers of Congress, but recent reports on prices rising by 6.2% are worrying for the American people. Dylan, I'm going to go to you first. Biden has introduced these ambitious plans from the American Rescue Act to, to the Build Back Better plan, but now we're seeing the rise in inflation. What explains these low approval ratings, and is it the economy, and can Biden recover? I think it's a bit unfair to uh, pit the blame solely on uh, Biden for these uh, issues, like any kind of mishaps he may have had. Because uh, while it is true that Biden has had some mishaps during his presidency, he also inherited a very tumultuous time. We've got uh, the, with the, he uh, promised his uh, constituents he would withdraw from Afghanistan. He's recovering from a pandemic. And look at what he ran on. He ran on a platform of building back, which is what he's planning on doing with this bipartisan infrastructure bill, and building back better, which is what he's planning to do, uh, putting reconciliation back on the table. So these are some things that um, he's down in the dirty work right now, trying to get these things done that he promised that needed to be done. He finally pulled out of Afghanistan. But um, as of right now, uh, the American public uh, don't see the value of it. And I think that uh, that can change, especially with the passage of the bill, infrastructure bill. Quentin, same question. Why are we seeing low approval ratings and how can Republicans capitalize on these approval ratings for the midterms? Oh, well, I mean, it's very simple. The Biden campaign over promised and has v currently under delivered. Uh, you know, we're looking at record inflation. We're looking at a disastrous troop withdrawal from Afghanistan. We're looking at party infighting that is holding up an infrastructure package. Uh, you know, I could go, we're, you know, 
President Biden is falling asleep at COP26. I mean, we're, we, the, the list can go on and on and on about issues that are concerning to the American voter right now. And ultimately, yeah, Republicans can capitalize and they should capitalize. And if they don't have a red wave in 2022, they deserve to lose them. This administration is fr frankly softballing them uh, a massive win come 2022. But if we're talking about what needs to get done and what needs to get done is Afghanistan needed to get withdrawn from. Oh, without, how long we without were Without question. President Trump himself even promised that we'd pull out of Afghanistan. Yeah, exactly. And uh, while President Biden could have done so much better in, with, in the withdrawal of Afghanistan, we were talking about American lives that, were need, that needed to be yeah, uh, and, pulled out from there. And there are now 11 dead Marines because of that. Uh, and at the end of the day, yes, Afghanistan needed to happen. However, the Biden administration said we're, you know, they've had two very conflicting messages. Oh, we had a plan for the Trump presidency and we had to follow his plan and that's why it sucked. But at the same time, oh, we didn't follow any of Trump's plan because it was all my idea and, and you know, I don't bear any responsibility for the outcome. I mean, it's, it's two utterly conflicting ish, uh, 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 messages on the same issue. And at the end of the day, look, Biden has to own up and understand that the intelligence uh, uh, mismanagement and asymmetry between the CIA, the Joint Chiefs, and the executive branch, uh, nobody was telling each other the truth, apparently, and that's on him. That's on his administration. Trump's out of the picture. He hasn't been in office for almost a year now. And at the end of the day, these are the policy issues that fall on the Biden administration. And these are the things people have seen in the 10 months. And these are the things people will come out and vote for in 2022. The January 6th House Select Committee issued 16 subpoenas in the past few weeks. President Trump is reaching his deadline to turn over documents and is fighting the deadline in court. Some of these subpoenaed include former aide Stephen Miller and former press secretary Kaylee McEnany. Steve Bannon was subpoenaed weeks ago, refused to comply, and is now being held in contempt, with the Department of Justice looking into the case. Bannon's refusal sets a precedent for this recent round of subpoenaed Trump officials. Dylan, how does the commission overcome the refusals to comply, especially if there are, there's a time limit if the House flips for next year? Well, we need to talk about why we're having this kind of, uh, why we're having this uh, bipartisan commission uh, issuing these subpoenas in the first place. What we had was a, uh, let's not sugarcoat it, it was a domestic terror assault on the United States Capitol, not seen since the War of 1812. So I think it's, uh, it's irresponsible and it's deplorable that people, that uh, these uh, Trump administration officials are not complying with the subpoenas. Uh, if they have nothing to hide, why don't they come, why, why don't they come forward and tell us exactly uh, what was happening during that day, what was going on inside the White House. And um, uh, ideally in a situation, time this time limit, if the House flips, shouldn't be an issue because we should have uh, bipartisan support to figure out uh, why this happened and how it could never happen again. And it's really, it's really a shame that we're talking about that. So, Quentin, with Bannon being held in contempt and the possibility of others called before the commission to comply, uh, refusing to comply, will anything get done with the committee? Well, it, it, it depends. The, one of the issues that I have with the January 6th commission uh, is whether the Congress has an ability to enforce subpoenas for non-legislative manners. Uh, the Supreme Court had ruled with regards to when the, the Congress wanted Trump's tax returns that it could not technically enforce those subpoenas because subpoenas for Congress are meant to be uh, held for hearings for legislative purposes. Now, the, s the committee argues that this is for a legislative purpose, therefore we do have the right to issue those subpoenas. So I, I think it, it certainly poses a very interesting question. Um, I think in part, I don't really expect anything to get done in part because I think there's a lot of partisan infighting. I think that the commission will, unfortunately it will probably fizzle out if there is a switch in the house. Um, and I think more importantly, I think law enforcement will be able to Fully, uh, fully investigate and understand what went down January 6th, who was involved, who were the players. Um, I mean, most of the people have been arrested and have been charged with crimes. They're sitting in jail right now. Um, so at the end of the day, I think that's what's gonna happen. Uh, it certainly poses interesting questions, uh, uh, but it's, I, I still see it as too early to know. What Don't you think it's though, uh, it's important to figure out who at the top was most, uh, was most to blame for this? Because um, I saw the tape, I saw the, uh, the speech myself, I witnessed uh, the assault on the Capitol. We're talking about a president who 
directly incited this riot against the well, Capitol. And we're talking about well, members of Congress, members of the former Trump administration who are, uh, if not defending, at least deflecting against this. Well, uh, on the issue of incitement, technically speaking, he was cleared of that in the second impeachment. So necessarily, if you're going to argue that point, you'd have to essentially rehash that impeachment argument. Um, However, no argument. I watched it myself. I watched him say we will fight. Acquitted. He watched him say so we have to fight. He, and so has a litany of other politicians, and that was the point. And did they, other politicians, uh, those words directly lead to an army of Trump supporters, or not even Trump supporters, an army of supporters in general, marching on a federal building and breaking in? I heard them. They were chanting, are, hang Mike Pence. People were carrying zip those, ties. It, that, that's, not the, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that the the... The issue around January 6th is what was the catalyst? And right now, the Trump, the Trump himself has not been charged in the impeachment with that direct incitement. So now it's a question of is who, of who said what, was this pre-planned? Were they going to do it regardless of what Trump said? Was it an unfortunate coincidence? Was it planned? I, I really don't know. And I think to suddenly level charges, in de who, who's to blame for what is, is very important here in this scenario? We could isolate what happened on January 6th from Trump himself because I think they're, they're two separate things. And although it, it, although it, it looks the way it looks and it certainly acted the way it was, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not privy to the to the committee hearings. I'm not privy to the knowledge of what went down. And while I understand that's the reason we need to have these hearings, I understand that. I think it's too early to make a judgment on who directly impacted what because we really don't know. It's all conjecture at this point. And that's going to be the last word on that. Um, well, that wraps up our second Capital Crossfire debate of the semester. Quentin Burian, Dylan Hayden, thank you for coming in for a lively debate, and I hope we found some consensus here today, and thank you again for coming on the show. When we come back, Willow Hassan has your fact check. Universities like George Washington play a critical role in hosting debate and discourse on events of the day. The right answer is not to refuse the other. The right answer is not to say, get rid of this religion. It's not part of us. It's wrong. I think that the story of America is a story of race. So when I think of the questions that I'm asking or the stories that I'm going to write, I'm thinking, OK, well, what are we learning about our country? Well, I think the likelihood of him being indicted is, is close to 100%. There was a lot of hurdles that had to be cleared in order for that to happen. One of the reasons that Donald Trump is president is because there is such a frustration with the way that Washington functions. Sympathy is one thing, but empathy is the language of recovery. And it's something that's without a doubt instilled into every person that's in recovery. It's never lead with the positive. It's always lead well, with the perceived negative. Well, I, that, is, that is part of the problem. I mean, I actually would agree with you on that. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that we have seen that is most under siege in this country is the notion of civil discourse, and we here at GW, among other things, very much want to stand for that. This is truly an only at GW moment. Welcome back. During our panel discussion, a team of fact checkers monitored our debate. Willow Hassan is here to tell us what we missed. Willow? Thanks, Jessica. Our debaters came prepared for today's debate with few errors. However, one clarification needs to be made. Republican Quentin Burian quoted a campaign ad in support of Jack Cetarelli that uses the quote by Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey saying, quote, if taxes are your issue, New Jersey is not for you. However, according to Governor Murphy, this quote was taken originally from the context of talking about high taxes for businesses, not families. And that's all for the fact check. Thanks, Willow. Well, that's all for this episode of Capital Crossfire. Be sure to check us out online at www.gw-tv.com and follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. For all of us at GWTV, I'm Jessica Nix. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. We'll see you back here next time.